Uh, my name is Mike Higgerson. What's up, Mission? If you're hanging out in the lobby or online or on the patio, I don't know what's wrong with you if you're on the patio. It's way too cold and way too wet in the Arctic blast of 2023. But man, just honored that Mission is a part of your weekend experience. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And let's just, I feel like God usually puts people in relationships that have different core temperatures. Um, and this Arctic blast has really revealed that. And so can you just turn to the person next to you and say, you can turn the thermostat up if you want to. So just go ahead and say it. I know that's hard for some of us. It's really difficult. Yeah, so it's really difficult. I know, I know. So uh, you don't have to wear a sweatshirt the entire time. It's going to be all right. I know we're inside. We're no fires, no natural gas. Dinell, I'm talking to you. That's Jim's wife. Anyway, um, no, on, honestly, honored that missions are part of your weekend. We are a church that exists to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we go after together. We aren't great, but Jesus is. And God rescues and saves. He sent Jesus into the mess to rescue and save us. Amen. To give us the right to be restored back to much loved sons and daughters. That's our God-given right. That's our God-given identity. That's our God-given calling. And we get to live out of that freedom. And that is great news for us. What we would say around at Mission is that there are no perfect people, that anyone is welcome, that change is possible. We don't have to stay stuck in the same hurts or habits or hangups that have got us in where we're at or the cycle that we keep living in. And that, that because of what God has done, there is hope for every single one of us. And it's important when we're starting out, because church people aren't always great at this, that like, we're, like we are all on the same, in the same boat without Jesus. So it's helpful for us on a Sunday morning at least to look at each other. And so I want, what I want you to do is the same person that you just told that they can turn the thermostat up. I want you to look at them with really kind eyes and just say, I want you to know this one thing from the very bottom of my heart that means the most to me in the entire world. And it's this, you are not Perfect. So just turn to them with joy in your heart and remind them of their imperfection. And they're going to remind you of your imperfection. It's great. If you're just hanging around at Mission New, you're like, what is going on? I'll tell you in a second. I'll tell you in a second. All right. Don't enjoy that too much. There's some of us, that's way too much joy out of reminding somebody else of their imperfection. What I would, what I would want us to know, though, is later on when you're actually in a real fight, like don't remind each other of your imperfection. Like, that's when you want to remind them of how imperfect they are. But it is great to do as the church together, as the people of God, not the building together, but the people together, that we are imperfect people, but for the grace of God. Like, we are rescued and saved. And so there are no perfect people, but there is hope for every single one of us, and we don't have to stay stuck in our imperfection. And yes, I've got notes every week, and so I'm sure that's a big shocker to you that I have notes up here, but there's been, th been some things that I've been just wanting to say. I just want, want to, there's some stuff that's not in my notes that I, I just want to just, as a friend, kind of talk about a little bit, and I'm not being funny, I'm being serious. I, for real, like, I feel like God is stirring up in people's lives, and, and, and I don't know if you're following Jesus or not following Jesus, I, I wouldn't pretend to understand the, like the complexity of your relationship with God, Jesus, and church, but man, I do not want us to miss it. Like, I don't want us to miss the chance to lean into what God is doing in our lives. And I don't, if you're walking in from the, like, and you're like, man, I haven't been to church in a minute, or like, or a decade, or like ever, like, I, you're so welcome here, but what I would say is that God has won some battle in our hearts and minds, and I do not want you, I do not want us to miss out what God is doing in these present moments, in this present season of how he wants to draw people back to him and give them the life that he's called them to. I just don't want us to miss it. And so we're going to do all this kinds of stuff as we're leading into Easter. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're big fans of Jesus here. So we're going to lift him up because he's the author and the perfecter of our life. But, I, man, I feel like God is stirring in hearts and minds and souls. And, man, lean in. If you're following Jesus, lean in. If you're, like not, if you're not, not sure what to, Jesus, what to do with Jesus, lean in, because I promise you he is up to something, and it's compelling, and I don't want you to miss it. It is the best possible way to live as a rescued son or daughter of the Most High God. And I don't want you to live beneath your privilege that you've been, that you've been given. And so lean in to that. And yes, is it, yes, it going like, to do some stuff in your heart? Yes, is he going to challenge you? Yes, is he going to convict us? Absolutely he is. But it is the most free way to live, and I don't want you to miss it. So we're in this series. That, that's, that was just for free. So that's not even in my notes. So that was just for free. But we're in this series called 
searching Jesus, and I've just started thinking through, like, if you think about magazines or websites or TV shows or movies or art or literature or music or medicine or social services or even the calendar, for goodness gracious, like, everything hinges on Jesus. He's the most represented person by far in all those areas. But man, when you search Jesus, or if we're on a search for Jesus, some things get complicated. And so what we thought we would do as we're thinking about this season of what it would mean for us to be our best selves, let, let's go on a search for Jesus. And so let's ask some questions and answer some questions like, who did Jesus hang out with? Like, where did he spend his time? Like, what made Jesus mad? I don't know. Are you allowed to get mad? I don't know. You know, anger's the second emotion. I mean, we, know, we know so much about all that right now, but what made Jesus mad? Like, let's talk about that next week. How did Jesus feel about prodigals or runaways or people that are rebellious? That's kind of what that word means. When did Jesus cry? Like, well, he's a man. He didn't cry. Like, why would he? We don't have feelings. What are those? I, he should not be crying. What's wrong with him if he's crying? Well, let's talk about it. When did, why did Jesus have to die? Like, what is this? If he's the greatest person in all of history, then what was his life leading to that point? We're going to talk about that. And then I put exclamations on this point, on this part, because I want us to get this right. Easter, it has one, two, three, four, five, six exclamation points. That's about as much as you can get right there for me. Easter is coming April 9th. I want us to be preparing our minds, our hearts, and let me be honest, our neighbors and our teammates and our coworkers and our family members. Like, Easter is coming. And I have this sense, I don't know what it is, I'm just telling, I'm just being honest, that something significant is going on in our world that is connected to what God is doing in our world, and I don't want us to miss it. So let's start preparing our hearts and our minds for Easter, and let's start thinking about, man, if God is up to something, we don't want to sit on the sidelines of it. Maybe God is stirring in, the, in, our heart, in the hearts and minds of our neighbors, our coworkers, our teammates, our friends. So let's maybe lean in like God would make his appeal, get this, through us. As if we were his ambassadors because we've been rescued, because we've experienced hope, because we know the forgiveness that comes with a relationship with God. We know where identity comes from as much loved sons and daughters. Maybe God would want to use us as trophies of his grace to be on display, and then maybe some of our friends would want to know the relationship with God that we've found because of the empty tomb. So let's get about it this Easter. I cannot wait. I'm super excited for what's happening. So we're in this, like we're talking about let's searching Jesus, and then who did Jesus hang out with? That's where we're going today. That's what we're talking about. So my hope for today is that we're going to do a big flyover of basically the entire New Testament with Jesus. So it's going to be really easy. And drop down on some categories of people that he hung out with. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what that means for us. So that's where we're headed. That's what we're doing. So let's get to work. Let's do it. So who did Jesus hang out with? The first one that came to my mind, the first one that I was studying, the first one I was looking at, I was like, women. And then some of us are like, okay, that feels predatory. You know, like, so it's like, it feels weird. Like, it's not like creepy Jesus hanging out with women, women or like, how you doing? Jesus hanging out with women. I don't mean it that way. What I mean is, what I mean when Jesus is hanging out with women, you need to understand in the context when Jesus showed up, in the culture that the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, women were viewed as less than. Women were viewed as property or things to be bartered with or taken advantage of. They had no rights. They had no value other than some things that we'll talk about in another conversation. Like that was what women were viewed at. And I'm not, that's not what we view women as. We don't have the context really of what, how women are viewed that way, hopefully. But when Jesus comes onto the scene, he has this way. When he is hanging out with women, it was unheard of. That someone, a man would even speak to a woman, let alone a religious man speak to a woman, let alone a teacher speak to a woman. Jesus changed the game with women. Women were excluded from spiritual instruction. It, wasn't, it was not normal. It would have been frowned upon. There was no way a man would have talked to a woman unless there was something on his mind. With me on that? There was no way. He doesn't just heal the woman with a bleeding disorder that we read in the New Testament. He actually refers to her as daughter, elevating her status from just a woman with issues to a woman that is dearly loved. Every time when Jesus is hanging out with women, he is elevating and not like, like looking down on. We, I mean, I'm just going to, just a few. Mary Magdalene, 
Mary and Martha, who are sisters, who was the, their brother was Lazarus. We read all about them. The Samaritan woman at the well. It's like he had to go there to meet that woman at that time with that story and that shame for that purpose in that place because he wanted to reveal himself and who he was to her. He's one of the first, she's one of the first people that he reveals who he actually is to a foreign woman in the middle of the day that had a reputation. And he says, I've got a, I've got a role for you and I want to elevate your role in the story. The woman at the well. The Canaanite woman, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Like, there wasn't a man caught in the act of adultery. Apparently, it was just the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. James and John's mom, you know, like Jairus' daughter, he is always elevating women. He is hanging out with women who were viewed as less than he makes equal. Every time Jesus hangs out with women, there is liberation, there is dignity, there is value, and there is love every single time with women. With women. They funded the mission. You start reading the New Testament, you realize that there are women that are funding the Jesus movement mission, right? They were the first person that told the story, or you could say preached the Easter message that the tomb was empty. He had to, like they had, the angel had to go to women because the men were all gone and they were going to show up or get the directions right, right? <laughs> so you could say there was no Easter without the women involved, right? And let me just say this, real men do not need women to be small in their life. And I don't mean by like size or stature. That's a whole other conversation that you need to have with your person. I mean by position or influence. Real men don't need women to be less than. And we see that in Jesus. Who did Jesus hang out with? Sinners. Woo. Just I feel like you need to receive that because that's all he had to work with, right? Like they're only broken people. There are no perfect people. All he had to hang out with was sinners. So we want to categorize sinners as some other category, but Jesus is like, that's all I got to work with. So I'm just going to hang out with them. Like Luke 9, these are the morally different people than Jesus. And what I love about Jesus, you got to read his biographies. I'm telling you. Like the people that were nothing like Jesus morally liked him and liked being around him and invited him in. And he seemed, this is crazy, he seemed to like them and want to be around them. And he wasn't real offended by them. In fact, in his words, not mine, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and save those that are lost. That's us. Mark 2, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but what? Join the club. No matter where you've been or what you've been through, Jesus is for you. He's not going to leave you where you are, but he is for you. He's not walking away from you. So they got women, we got sinners, and then we've got this unclean. Like that would be like the, the socially like different or the outcast or the sick or the marginalized, the ones that we kind of move out. Jesus had this way of being about them and around them wherever he was, the sick and the outcast. There was this belief back in the day that if someone was sick, then they must have done something wrong. Or if it seemed like someone got a bad deal in life, then they must have something morally wrong about them. And so they were shunned or they were outcast. They didn't quite know what to do with like contagious disease because we figured all that out right now. So they didn't quite know what to do with all that. So they would make, they would like, like make them leave the city. They would make them put them in their own colonies. We're talking about leprosy or any kind of disease that you want to talk about. They were always shunned. They were kicked out of church. They were kicked out of families. They were kicked out of anything social because they didn't quite know what to do. So they were just outcast and marginalized and unclean out there. And Jesus had this way of being around them. And the untouchable, he would touch. And the unseeable, he would see. And the un, like, we, you're annoying, like even his followers would always like be trying to keep people away. He's like, yeah, this is Jesus, he's a big deal. You know, like, you gotta stay away, gotta stay away, gotta stay away. And he would always look for the person that no one else sees. He saw, it's compelling when you read how and you understand how Jesus lived for women, for sinners, for the unclean. And we're talking about tax collectors. 
We're not talking about like IRS, you're good if you work for the IRS, you're good. You're just like not another category. What tax collectors means when you're reading about Jesus and who he hung out with, these are the people that were sellouts to their culture and they were politically corrupt. They were occupationally different and they were politically different than everyone around them. So what happened was Rome came in, would conquer people, and then they would get taxes from people. Can you imagine getting taxed for the land that you live in? That's what we do. So we're like they would tax people and then but they would put pers- a person in charge that was was local and of those people, and then that person, let's say that the tax was 10%, that person could charge 30% if they can enforce it, and they could keep the 20%. So Rome needed 10%, this person could charge whatever they want. So anyone living in the culture knew what Rome would charge, and anyone else that was under them, and they would charge more, they considered them a sellout and a traitor politically and occupationally. They hated tax collectors. It's not just because they worked for the IRS or Rome, it's because they were taking advantage of their position and, and, and taking advantage of their people that they were supposed to be serving. Everyone hated tax collectors. They were sellouts politically and socially. They were corrupt. But Jesus hung out with them. He had this way of being around them and calling them to a better life. In fact, one of the guys that was a tax collector ends up following Jesus and repaying all the stuff by three times, like multiple, like, uh, like paying it back of people that he took advantage of because there's this way when you follow Jesus and you understand the rescue that you live generously. And he is like, man, I've taken advantage of so many people. I need to change my life and Jesus has changed my life and I'm gonna live differently and I need to go make it right. And when you follow Jesus, full disclosure, he's gonna push you to make it right. And you got to go because you've been rescued. So we got women, we got sinners, we got unclean, we got tax collectors, we got poor. And we're like, yes, yes, Splanograph Jesus should be hanging out with the poor. Like you can teach this message, you know. Like if God were going to show up, he's going to show up, show up with, to the poor. And like that's the way that God does. And no one had much in the culture that Jesus showed up in. No one had much, but everybody was trying to do the caste system. Like they were trying to figure out if they could escalate up the ladder of the social system because no one had anything. And it's hilarious to me when you read the New Testament that people were valued based on what they had. Like that's changed a whole lot around here. But Jesus hung out with the poor. Jesus' teaching humanized the poor. That they weren't just a problem to be solved. They were a people to be loved and served. And more often than not, have a clearer understanding of the goodness of God than anyone else. We have to concern, be concerned for their well-being. We have to be concerned, like we can't ignore them or be, let them be disenfranchised. In fact, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord, this is Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to, pray, to pro- proclaim good news for the poor. And so if the good news we are proclaiming is not for the poor, like the poor can't get it or understand it, then somehow we're missing the good news that Jesus came to proclaim. And then he also said, Luke 14, but when you give a banquet, throw a party, whatever you're doing, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There was this way that Jesus lived and challenged us to, to say, they are in my kingdom. And you, if you're not poor, invite them in. But he also hung out with the rich the financially less than and the financially like more than. He was never mad at rich people because of their money or what they had. He w- there was always an invitation, always an invitation to follow. Read the biographies. He's never mad about you and your money. He just doesn't want your money to get your heart. And so Jesus is always inviting people of low standing financially or high standing, uh, high standing financially. He is dignifying them and he is calling them to follow him and he is inviting them on the mission. Like we start reading the New Testament, there's Nicodemus, there's Joseph of Arimathea, which is actually the tomb that Jesus was buried in. He's a rich guy, part of like the religious elite that has some means. And like, so he's a follower of Jesus because we know in the New Testament, he says it's a follower of Jesus. So apparently you can be a follower of Jesus in secret, have influence and have social standing and financial standing because the New Testament calls Joseph of Arimathea like a follower of Jesus. And when Jesus died, guess who goes and collects his body and puts it in his tomb? We need Joseph of Arimathea to be in his position with his means for the right purposes so Easter can happen. So we follow where Jesus can be rich, but rich in things that matter. We look at the rich young ruler. 
Like who Jesus hung out with, Zacchaeus is a wee little man. And a wee little man was he, but he climbed up to the sycamore. But, but he's a man of a means and influence and an invitation to follow. And then Simon the Pharisee, Jesus is having dinner in his house, a man of means and influence. That's when a sinful woman comes and anoints his feet with her hair, right? That's what we talked about last week. We talked about the Roman centurion, a man of means and influence. Jesus is around, and they come to Jesus and want relationship with Jesus, and he always invites them to follow him, and he always invites them into his mission, always. So there's the poor, the rich, women, sinners, unclean. You keep going down the list of who Jesus hung out with, but he also hung out with friends. And this is one of maybe my most favorite things about Jesus. He's a king that doesn't just treat people like subjects. He treats them like friends. In fact, he said it this way, John 15, like, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. We get to be in with Jesus as friends. No matter what category you find yourself in these days, no matter how you would describe yourself these days, we get to be in and known as a much-loved, rescued son or daughter of the Most High God and a friend of Jesus. On our worst day, we're in with him. And then I start looking like, who did Jesus hang out with? And I'm like, okay, well, I got to take, you know, he hung out with God a lot. So I feel like I, as a pastor, I at least need to say God. Because that's we're in church, so we got to say that he hung out with God. But the, how do you get this ability to love and be with all these other people is that you know who you are and loved by a really good God. And you're able to extend that love to other people. That's what we spent the whole last series talking about. But there was this way that Jesus lived when he was engaged and spending time with God on a regular daily basis just by himself. Because if Jesus needed to be reminded who he was and what he was called to, then we need to be reminded about who we are and what we're called to when we spend time with God. And I'm afraid that some of us are trying to do all the right things without being connected in the right way. And Jesus needed to do it. He spent time with God. Luke 6, 12 said, one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. You start looking at significant moments of Jesus' life. When you're reading through the biographies, you're gonna realize that there are times and moments that are recorded for us when he gets away by himself to spend time with God because he knew what was getting ready to happen in the next, or big decisions of his life, or the big movements of his life. It's just a a habit that he had that we need to incorporate, spending time with God. Luke 5, 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I'd love to know what he prayed. I'd love to know the curriculum that he had so that he could know exactly what he was studying, what he was learning. But we need to realize that our, if we're trying to do this spiritual life not connected to the power that comes from a relationship with God, we're going to end up in a really bad place because we're doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons and not connected to the vine. So we need to spend time with God. And again, let me just call time out for a second, okay? Jesus is so compelling. We start realizing that we categorize people all around us. And Jesus was just with people all the time. And he wasn't, you're like, well, I, I, you know, they're going to influence me back. Jesus was never influenced in the wrong way when he was spending time with people that were morally corrupt. Because that's all he had to work with. So if for you, wisdom is like, I can't be around that or I'll be tempted to do that. Jesus was never in that way. So there is some wisdom around boundaries, but Jesus was also like not keeping people at a distance that needed the hope and love that he had to offer. So that's who he hung out with. What does that mean for us? Super glad you asked that. The first thing I would say is that I am invited in. You are invited in. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, No matter what you've been through, no matter what you think about God, no matter what you think about Jesus, no matter which way you vote, no matter the color of your skin. Okay, I need to just keep going down the list here. Like, like, no, in spite of our past, Jesus is like, I'm so shocked. I didn't know that. Well, I don't know if I can invite you in. No, he knows everything about us and says, I'm for you. Specifically, not them, you. I'm for you. 
and you're invited in. And what we can know about who Jesus hung out with, I'm invited in, second one, so are they. Yeah, them. I mean, you got categories in your mind. I don't even know what they are. But you got them. They are invited in. Jesus would hang out with them. The religious zealots that are whack and the morally corrupt that are crazy. Yeah, them. He's for them. He's not stamping everything on, about them, but he's inviting them in, and he came for them. If he came for me, he came for them. And the challenge that we would have is this great commission that Jesus gave us, that we're partnered with him in this mission together. We are co-missionaries, co-missioned on what we're supposed to be about. Matthew 28 would say it this way. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I had a friend recently that said, are you like, trying to win the whole world to Jesus? And I was like, yes. That's our commission. And we're not doing it with power or position. We're doing it with service and love as rescued sons and daughters. That's our mission. We also have not just the great commission, we also have the great commandment in the way that we do it. Matthew 22, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets Old Test, that's like the entire fat front part of, your, part of your Bible are based on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. We have a great commission and we have a great commandment. Let's get about it. So Jesus invited people in, invites us in, people that were morally different, ethnically different, Different gender than he was. Social standing was different. Financial position was different. Religious level was different. Political leanings were different. Jesus invites us in. And I don't know where you've been. And I don't know what you've been through. But I have this sense. And I would beg of you to consider. If Jesus would want to invite you in. Or back in. To his mission. And his way. Why don't you pray with me? God, you are good, and you are great, and you are up to something in our days, and we don't want to miss it. God, we have the right to be restored as much love sons and daughters. Would you help us lean into that? Because we have been rescued by a great God and invited in to your story and your mission. God, we love you. No matter who we are or where we've been, you died for us to make us right with you. Man, we're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.